I want to welcome you all to Empowering Pastors and Leaders Training. We're very glad that you're here today. We are going to have a short session, but it's a very important session. And um, this one is going to have a lot of opportunity for question and answer. And so um, we're going to have somebody running in the sanctuary with a microphone. And I want to remind you, the reason we use a microphone is for those that are watching online cannot hear you without. So today I want to talk to you about a job of leaders. And it's one where a lot of times where we're mainly visionaries, we're talking about vision, we're talking about casting vision, we're talking about keeping vision uh, with fluidity and so on and so forth. But another part of, and probably I believe the largest part of leadership besides vision is you're actually leading people. Leading people is the challenge of leadership. And uh, the challenge of leadership is for the leader and the work that the leader has and the responsibility to bring those that he's leading to the vision is the ability to identify the cycles in their life. Now, some people will call them patterns, but cycles are the terminology to that, that I use. And in fact, many times you've heard me talk about what we call the cycle of, of love. Every time you love, you become vulnerable. Every time you become vulnerable, it is inevitable that you are going to get hurt. Every time you get hurt, you must forgive. If you do not forgive, you cannot love again. It is a cycle. And there are certain cycles that are a major part of who we are and what we do. And in leadership, there are also cycles as you are the leader, whether it be your department, whether it be a church, whether it be a company, your job is to get the people that you're leading where you need them to be so they can make you more successful. And that's ultimately the job of the leader besides casting vision. Because if you could do it yourself, then it's not really vision. Vision demands that you have followers. We've all heard the old statement. I've said it a million times. If you call yourself a leader but you have no followers, you're only going for a walk. So as a leader, we have followers, and as followers, we have a specific job that we have with them. And the specific job is to help them maturate and grow to a level and a position to where they're going to be able to take that portion of the vision that you are trusting them with to the next level. Now, we also know that who got you here might not be able to get you there. But the truth is, is that most people can get you there if they're actually willing to grow. Uh, old statement we've also had here is, if you don't grow, you gotta, you gotta go. Well, why is that? Well, because if we have to spend so much time and, and energy in, in growing you, yet you don't want to grow, then ultimately there's no way for you to take the vision that your portion of the vision you're responsible for and bring it to the next level. You can't do it. So as leaders, our job is to identify cycles in the people that we're leading. What does that mean? Well, there are good cycles and there are bad cycles. You um, can tell usually a good cycle. Let's, we can talk about Timothy real quick. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, it talked about the faith of his grandmother and mother, which now Paul sees in him. That's a cycle. It went from one generation to the other generation. And many times, what we identify as cycles usually are generational. And so as we are learning people, now I want you to say that out loud, I learn people. That's your job as a leader is to learn people. Your job is to learn how people think, to learn how people work, to learn how people move. And then moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit as Jesus looked and said, uh, I see you're a man with no guile. Well, how did you see that? Well, why you're under the tree? You know, he had a word of knowledge. So there's spiritual aspects of learning people, and then there are just psychological or understanding humanity. But in any capacity, as a leader, our main job is to take the, the followers that we have and the people that have been put in our responsibility to identify their cycles, and once we identify their cycles, then bring them to a place of greater success by helping them identify their cycles, and therefore, 
once they identify them, giving them the tools to go beyond where they are. If we can uh, do that, then we're not really leading. And really what we're doing is we're exercising our vision. Because if you don't have the right people holding your ladder, as the teaching of Samuel Chand is, then the people, not hold, or the people holding your ladder that don't have the capacity to break off negative cycles, then you cannot go where you need to be. Really, so as a leader, without you paying attention, you literally are, de uh, are demolishing or uh, committing demolition in your own vision by not identifying the cycles of the people that you're growing. And that's our job, growing people. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus spent three years growing people. Let's look at Peter's cycle. Peter had a very bad cycle, cycle of arrogance. He was a man that, you know, just said what he thought, did what he thought, et cetera, et cetera. But something happened, and this is the sad part about most cycles, most cycles are not usually addressed or dealt with within individuals until there's a catastrophic event in their life. But people don't have to wait that long to change a cycle that's negative if they're willing to be led there by their leader. So our job is to identify cycles in our people. What is a cycle? Well, everybody has them. We all live a certain way. We all do a certain thing. In fact, um, we actually talked about this at a breakfast a few weeks ago, and the suggestion was, can you please teach this as well? How many of you take a shower? Okay, not everybody in the room. Uh, that concerns me. Uh, that's a cycle, bad cycle we want to break in your life. Amen. If you recognize when you get out of the shower, you grab a, a towel. When you grab a towel, you start drying off. The majority of people dry off in a cycle. They have a habit in a way that they actually do something. So if you looked at yourself, do you start on your head? Do you start on your sh shoulders? Do you start on your arms? I always, uh, I always grab it and I wipe my face first and then I start going down my arms. I go down my, uh, my frontal and then I go down my back and then I step out and I do my legs and start with my feet up. And, and so therefore I recognize that I do something on a consistent basis even in the capacity of me showering and getting out of the shower. Do you wash your hair first? Do you wash your face first when you're in the shower? Um, when, you, when you do your hair, how do you do your hair? You know, we all have cycles. We all do something perpetually. We all do something without even thinking about it because it's become a cycle of our life. And I'm just talking simply about um, hygiene. But where cycles actually have to be addressed as leaders, as we are leading people, is the cycles of the life that literally is debunking them from maturating to a place of perpetuating greater results in their life. And that usually is something that they themselves don't even know. Um, let me ask you a quick question. When you brush your teeth, which side do you start on? Right bottom. Right in the middle. Left bottom. What's that? Left bottom. Okay. Anybody else? Do you even know? Do you realize you do the same thing probably every single morning you don't even realize you're doing it? And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about cycles because people come to work, they do a certain thing at work, and they'll change for a little bit, but then most people will go back to their cycle. Most people don't even recognize, but they'll do the same thing all the time. And I'm talking even in the work essence to where you literally might start off strong and end off weak. You get tired at a certain time of the day. You get hungry at a certain time of the day. You are more productive at certain times of the day. You have a cycle. You live a certain way. Now, when it's a positive thing, well, then that's awesome. But many times we live cycles that are very negative. Well, let's just talk about one. You ever talk to somebody and every time you bring something up to them, they get defensive? 
Well, that's a cycle. Well, why are they getting defensive? They don't know. They've never even thought of it. They don't know why they're defending themselves. They feel attacked. Well, why do they feel attacked? Well, when you start to research that in their life, you usually come back to a position where either their, uh, with their family or their, a, a parent usually was demeaning to them or was ignoring to them. And every time that there was some type of communication to them, it was more accusational. So therefore, they lived a defensive lifestyle. And, and now everything and every time that something is brought up to them, not even to be, uh, not even to be something that is aggressive negatively, but all of a sudden they're, they're automatically reacting out of the cycle of life. You've heard me call it psycho-cybernetics before, where we return back to how we did things even when we were seven, eight years old and we're in our 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. But until you recognize your own cycle, you're going to be unwilling to change your cycle because you can't even identify your cycle. Most people do not have enough self-awareness to actually recognize why they do what they do, where they go, how they act, how they react. In fact, they are completely unaware of their own activity. And until you're going to start paying attention to your own activity, well, then you can't help the people that are under you as leaders. Why do you lead the style you lead? Why do you speak to the people the way you speak to them? Why do you sit at your desk the way you sit at your desk? Everything we do has cycle to it. As a leader, there must be enough awareness of your own life to identify why you do what you do. Because as leaders, we must look at the people under us and identify their cycles. It's one of the very first things I do when I, I start going into a room or uh, I have somebody that's in my leadership responsibility. I watch them. I just watch what they do. And usually, they'll repeat it. If a person, uh, I, I was talking about it the other day, I knew this man that was very gifted, pretty much at everything. And he would always get really mouthy. So I watched him long enough and figured out how to shut him down. I realized that when he got overwhelmed, he would stop doing everything. He would stop talking. He would become a, reclu a recluse. So when I wanted to disembark him from his negativity, I would start to overwhelm him with responsibility. Therefore, I would shut his mouth down without having to say anything to him, knowing that he would never be willing to change his cycle. So therefore, I was able to control his environment by identifying his cycle, therefore bringing him to a place of recluse when I needed him to be quiet all without him knowing what I'm doing. But if I never identified his cycle, then I would never be able to shut him down. There are people that work that will sit at their desk and look busy, but do nothing. Well, if you see that after a long period of time, then you know that that's a cycle they're gonna stay in. So what do you do? If you identify their cycle, if you don't want to deal with them, then you have to be able to either change their cycle without them knowing it or move them in a position to where you're going to get the greater results out of them. So if I see somebody that's constantly at their computer, and many times what I'll do is I'll go to the computers even of the church and I will do a history check of where you've been, what you've done, what you're doing, and I will be able to see your cycle. Many times, uh, I'm up until I think we just changed a way that kind of messed me up. But for many years, I loved GoDaddy and I kept this on GoDaddy even though it cost us more money simply because I could go and research everything that you do on your emails. I can still do it. Someone needs to teach me. 
Why? Well, because I was able to see people's cycles. I could get on their history. Most people delete history, but never delete the history of the history. So you get in there and you can actually tell what websites they've been to. You can tell what games they're playing. You can tell the activity they have. They look busy, but they're not busy. So therefore, if they're at their computer and not producing, because now I'm able to evaluate their cycle, then I can move them from their computer and put them in a position without them even knowing it of changing their cycle without them knowing it. Therefore, putting them in a position of it being more productive so I can get the work out of them that I'm paying them for. So all of this has two forms. One, where you can identify a cycle within an individual that you are leading to bring change to their life. Or number two, bringing an individual to an understanding of their own cycle and empowering them to change their own cycle. Fact is, is that most people aren't gonna change. That is the truth. It's sad. But the fact is, is that most people do not wanna change. Most people don't wanna change their cycle. Why? Because it takes work to change your cycle. That's why when you saw Peter's greater change, Peter's greater change became, came because he denied Jesus three times and the Messiah died on the cross and he ran away and wept bitterly. There was a change in Peter from that point on. Pain produces change. But the problem is, is that when you bring the cycle to most people, even though the cycle is only going to destroy them, even though you reveal it to them, many people don't want to change that cycle because it's too comforting for them to remain in the rut that they're in rather than have to work to get out of it to become more of a productive human on the planet. So there's two forms of this. As a leader, you've not only got to be able to identify the cycles of the people that you have, but then you've got to discern whether there are going to be people that are going to be willing to change themselves or you're just going to have to move them around without them even knowing it. Now, the problem with the latter is it takes more work. The problem with the latter, what ends up happening is you're going to constantly have to micromanage them for the rest of their working lifestyle with you, which is not productive. The more you have to micromanage people, the more you as a leader cannot do what you're called to do. So the necessity to be able to discern whether somebody's gonna be willing to change or, or change their cycle or not willing to change their cycle is also gonna determine your capability of movement within your organization to bring the vision to fruition. So as you identify them, you then have then categorized them in a categorization of them, then you have decisions to make. The ones that are unwilling to move, how are you going to move them out and move somebody else in without causing great abrasion and or trial and tribulation to where it's going to cause friction within your organization? The, the other is the greater that is helping somebody to identify their cycle, but most people, because you can identify their cycle with them, but they do not have the knowledge or capabilities of formulating a plan to break a cycle. So therefore, you have to train people or give them the tools to break the cycles that are in their life that are not going to bring greater production. Now, a lot of leaders don't want to do this either, and I'll tell you why. It takes work. So many pastors have said to me, I've said to them, you know, I do training on Tuesdays, and I meet with my staff on this, and they tell me, well, I just don't have the time to do that. You know what they're saying to me? I don't have the time to develop people to be greater producers. So what they have to do constantly is hire and fire, hire and fire, hire and fire, hire and fire. Restart, 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 restart. It takes more time 
to identify cycles. It takes more time to train somebody out of a cycle. But in the long run, you're actually saving yourself because you're not having to consistently hire and fire. Start, restart, start, restart. I don't want to do that. I want to be a leader that can take the leaders and develop them. And what you'll find is if that you find an individual that is willing to tra transition out of a negative cycle and you as a leader are willing to invest in them and help them out of it, that their loyalty level to you is now higher because you brought transition that is going to bring, bring greater production to their life. But it takes more time. So most leaders don't want to do this. They just want to cycle people in and cycle people out. So again, let's get back to it. Ready? As a leader, our job is to cast vision. Then we have to gain followers. Why? Because if you can do the vision yourself, then it's not really vision at all. So now you have followers. Now your job is to identify the cycles within your leaders that are positive and negative, and let's look at the negative ones, and let's say, okay, now we have to categorize again. Am I gonna put them in the category of they're never gonna change, or am I gonna put them in the category that they're gonna be willing to change? The people now that you have in the unwilling to change, you now know you have to move them out of your organization because there's no way for you to maturate and to grow to the next level of the vision because you can't take them with or you're going to be so constantly and consistently having to micromanage them that you're never going to be able to yourself propel vision because you're always going to have to work with your people here. But once you've identified the people that are willing to change in their cycle, now you have to make a decision of how I'm going to invest in them to teach them the triggers that they have that constantly cause, remember what a cycle is, it's constantly rolling over, rolling over, and doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. How am I going to stop that? Yeah. One day I was, a, as, a, as a young man, very young, probably, probably 10 or 11, Sean Tui and I used to go, and he's a friend of mine, we used to go to Beeman's Pond uh, to go fishing, bullhead fishing, or what we call hornpout fishing in Massachusetts. So we'd get on our one-speed bicycles, and we'd, uh, we'd put our fishing poles on the back, and we'd ride, uh, ride three miles to Beeman's Pond, and we'd drag our bicycles into the pond about a half a mile back in, and we'd sit on the rock with our worms, and we'd start casting, we'd catch bullhead, and, and then we'd put them on the stringer. And one day, I had caught probably seven or eight of those uh, horn pow on that, uh, on that trip, and I had them on the stringer, and um, it's time to ride home. So I am put my hands on the handlebar. Where's the only place you, well, I'm just hanging the fish on the stringer. They're swinging back and forth. I'm going down the hill, and all of a sudden, the stringer swung, and it went into the front wheel, into the front spokes, and I'm seeing bullhead fly everywhere, and me too. I stopped the cycle. It was quick, somewhat painful, and it was real. When you stop somebody's cycle, it's bloody. Because most people don't want to see where they have their issues. They don't want to see where they have to change. So, when you address them, it usually gets a little muddy. When you start identifying the triggers, when you start identifying the things in their life that are causing this cycle, it brings up situations in their life that is uncomfortable because when you have a negative cycle, it's because you've been created within that cycle through many times generational, even as Timothy was with his faith. So the person that you're working with has to be willing to identify or be willing to have revealed to them their cycles. And that's really not hard to do as a leader. This is why you're doing what you're doing. I can see this is what triggers your cycle. Okay, so let's identify that. Now let's get a little bit deeper. How are we going to stop this cycle? Every gun is dangerous. Every gun with a bullet in the chamber is dangerous. But it doesn't mean it's going to kill somebody, and it doesn't mean it has to go off. 
You can even have the safety. In fact, if you use a Glock, there is no safety. The difference between the gun going off and the gun not going off is someone pulling the trigger. When you're starting to work with the people that you've identified their cycle and they genuinely want to transition out of that cycle to become more of a productive human on the planet and to fulfill God's purpose for their life, then as you identify their trigger, they then have to be willing to take their finger off the trigger. It will always be there. The tendency to return back to the cycle will always be there. In fact, some will break a cycle and then go back to the cycle because they go into a place of lethargy in their life. But if you find an individual that truly wants to accelerate in life and be successful in life, and success is fulfilling God's purpose, and also being a producer, then that gun is always loaded. The finger is always near the trigger. The atmosphere is always available. But the person has to be willing, once you've helped identify the cycle, now you've given them the tools to get their finger off the trigger, they have to be willing to not put their finger on the trigger and pull the trigger to continue the cycle. This is why most people don't want to or most people will not change. It demands attention. It demands apprehension. It demands that the individual cannot do what they've always done. You've heard the old statement. If you always do what you've always done and you get the same result, it is insanity. People live in sanity every day. They look at somebody successful and they go, oh my goodness, they're so successful, I wish I could be them. Well, you could be them. The difference between you and them is not that you're, they're a better person. The difference between them is they've been willing to apprehend some of the cycles of their life. So as a leader, we have huge responsibility not just to lead the organization, but we're leading people. So for me, I'm constantly watching. I'm constantly listening. I'm constantly evaluating. I'm seeing when people are doing things in a negative fashion, or if I'm not seeing the results I want to see, I now am not talking to them. I now am watching them. Why am I watching them? Because I want to see why they're not producing. It's not that they can't produce. I want to see why they're not producing. I want to see why they're not self-motivated. I want to see why they're not willing to move forward. I want to see why they, in their brain, come on now, in their brain, they're doing what they think is right or they wouldn't be doing it. So why? When you start watching cycles you start listening to their words and then they start telling you why they do what they do without them knowing that they're doing it. The more you listen as a leader and watch as a leader, the more you're able to identify without having to crash into their world. And once you've identified it, now you take the time to invest in them if they're willing to bring transition to their life and teach them where their triggers are, teach them where their weaknesses are, once you start telling someone of their weaknesses, they're either going to get defensive, and the moment they start becoming defensive, you know that most likely the resistance that they're pushing forward with is going to keep them from actually moving forward because they're going to resist even the suggestions you're going to make. Being a teachable leader or being a teachable person is imperative for continued learning. I don't mind being told when I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, and I've, you've heard me say it, if I'm preaching bad doctrine, come let me know, sit in my office, show me where I'm wrong scripture, and I'll stand up behind the pulpit and I'll apologize. I've been told multiple times that I'm a bad leader. I shared with you that one event, and I, I don't know, I think Pastor Dan and Pastor Cody were the only ones in the room, where I, I did a, uh, a thing on culture, and I asked everybody, would you want your children, would you allow your children to work, uh, would you allow your children to work at his Tabernacle Family Church? 
And the only one who said yes was Cody. Everybody else said no. I wanted to fire everybody. Except you. Because you said yes. Pastor Dan's still here. But do you remember that? My face went very blank. I was very angry. You get the privilege of working for God and getting paid and you're telling me you wouldn't even allow your kids? Well, what it was was the culture was so bad because of my, listen, as the leader, it was my problem. And I immediately started educating myself on the different cultures and seeing some very bad tendencies that I had that were very aggressive tendencies that were creating an atmosphere and, and a position where people were not free to actually grow and do what they needed to do. But it was very captivating, and I don't mean captivating in a positive sense, but captivating. I capped them. I drove them, I didn't lead them. I didn't create a conducive, but I created an aggressive environment. And I had to bring change. And then next time, I don't remember how many years it was, Pastor Dan, maybe you can help me, but I did it again, and, and all of them said, yeah, I would let my kid work at the church. But that change didn't come an, in an easy manner. That demanded me to change who I was, how I led, what I liked, what I thought was right. Listen now, I'm doing it on a constant basis. You know, we just had our staff meeting. Majority of our staff meeting are under 40 years old. Do you think it's fun sitting in a room of people under 40 years old? No, it's not. Even this morning, Pastor Aaron, he was so cute this morning, <clears throat> talking about 50-year-olds. And uh, then he talked about 60-year-olds. And he wasn't meaning anything negative, but all us 50-year-olds perked up. And then all of a sudden, the 60-year-old poked up. It's like, uh, we thought he was going to get decapitated in the meeting. But you see, we think different than you guys think. You know, we have this new thing. Uh, and Pastor Cody came up to me and he said, what do you think about doing a family-friendly office? And my initial internal reaction was, that is stupid. Why would you do that? We won't get anything done. But I didn't say nothing. And I said, what do you mean by that? And I let him pitch. Then I asked some other people and then I talked to other leaders. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm still very much against it. But I know that it's going to be productive. And so even though it's against my cycle of work and how I've always done work, this generation doesn't work the same way I work. It doesn't mean I'm right and they're wrong. It means the cycle has changed. So either as a leader, I change or I drive out the younger generation that's gonna be leading the church and are already. So everybody has to change. Everybody has to break cycles. Everybody has to address who they are and why they are and why they do what they do and then how they do what they do. But the fact is that most people don't want to do that because it's going to demand attention. It's going to demand reaction. It's going to demand transition. And most people don't want to do that. But until you choose to do that as a leader, you can't develop the leaders under you. Therefore, your vision is stymied because you can only go as high as the leaders you have under you. So it takes more work as a leader to identify cycles. It takes more attention to identify cycles within your people. And then it takes more time to identify and then work with the triggers that they have and then to bring transition to their lives. You know, um, my staff and I meet every week, Wednesdays and Thursdays, we sit down um, at Sugar and Spice and we talk. We laugh, we joke, we sometimes get into conversations like this. Sometimes we don't get anything to do with church. But why am I doing that? I'm revealing myself. 
I'm doing that for relationship because I love you, but also it enables me to see where you're at and you to do the same for me. And in that, I'm able to identify cycles. I'm able to identify triggers. And sometimes at that table, we sit down and we talk about solutions. How are you going to change the negative cycle in your life? Now, we don't call it negative because you're going to have resistance. But why do you do what you do? How can we change this? How can we make this better? And we bring about opportunity for transition. So cycles are in every single person's life. You live them. You have them now. Even how you're sitting, even what you're thinking is all part of cycles. Are you aware of your cycles? Are you aware, let's just say, of two positive cycles you have in your life and then two negative cycles you have in your life. So there's your homework. I want you to identify two positive cycles in your life. And then I want you to identify two negative cycles in your life. And then with the two negatives, I want you to devise a plan to take one of them, not both of them, just one of them and transition it. If you and I will do that, and we can change, let's just say, three cycles a year, you don't have to change one a month even. Three cycles a year, your whole life will be different. It doesn't take a lot to change the direction of a vessel. The larger the vessel, the longer it takes to move the vessel. But no matter what, you're still moving the vessel. In all of the people that you lead, you have people that are in your departments that have bad cycles. <clears throat> the question isn't that they have bad cycles. The question is, you, have you identified the bad cycles that are gonna hold back the vision for your department? And if you have, then have you taken the time to teach them to, put, to identify their own trigger to get the finger off the, the trigger of the gun therefore to develop them as leaders. If leaders aren't developing leaders, then what are you doing? You're just task-oriented. Task-oriented people are not leaders. Task-oriented people are just fulfilling an obligation in front of them. If you are just task-oriented, then you could give a flying leap about somebody's success. You just want to see success. But success can only come through other people because true success is empowering others to fulfill their destiny. What holds them back from their destiny are the negative cycles. That's your job to identify and power so they can transition. And then the whole organization moves. As you've heard me say and applauded my staff, when Rhonda was sick for three years, I really was disconnected as a leader here. I had to take care of my wife. But this church grew during that time. How was that possible? Because I had spent the time to train you. I had spent the time to sit with you. I had spent the time to work with you. And in that, your leadership capabilities accelerated. And therefore, 
Demise didn't occur, but success occurred even during difficult, tumultuous times. That is not accidental. And a leader that is not willing to do that, when the times of difficulty comes, you really don't have leaders. You only have followers. And if you only have followers and the leader is disconnected, then you only have chaos. There is never order in chaos, just death. It's scriptural, right? Where there is no prophetic revelation, vision, my people perish. So what's your job? To identify your cycles. Then to identify the people in your department cycles. Positive and negatives. And then to empower them to be able to take their finger off the trigger to change their personal cycles so they can accelerate as a human and then accelerate the vision that you have. If you'll do that, it takes more time, but you'll create what we've been talking about, and that is momentum. And momentum doesn't take a lot of attention. It just takes the energy. Questions? Wow, very good. Thank you very much for tuning in. We appreciate your time. We pray that this was a blessing and helpful for you as a leader. And I want to remind you, if you have homework, that uh, it is a $25 fine if you do not fulfill your homework. And uh, you can send it to Pastor Spencer at iCloud.com uh, just by the uh, beginning of next week. If not, then you can slip me either $25 cash or send it to my PayPal account at PastorSpencer at gmail.com. And I uh, have no problem buying Harley Davidson parts with that money and uh, appreciate your time. Everybody have a great day. If you would like more information about our, our ministry as developing leaders, you can go to empoweringpastors.com. Have a great day.